Thank you, David, and thanks to you all for coming along this afternoon. For those of you listening in online as well, thanks for taking the time to do this. Recently, uh, a few weeks ago, I went for a walk up Glen Esk. And if you've ever been up Glen Esk and you walk along the valley, uh, up the Glen, about two thirds of the way up, you'll find uh, this structure here. It's actually a, a kind of monument, and you can just see in the, in the, uh, between the, the bases there, you see the well. And it's a well that Queen Victoria apparently uh, drank out of when she was there in 1816. And actually, if you look closely, there was actually a, a stone. I took a picture of the stone, but I could hardly read what it actually said. But this is what it uh, apparently says at the site. Her Majesty Queen Victoria and His Royal Highness the Prince Consort visited this well and drank of its refreshing waters on the 20th of September 1861, the year of Her Majesty's great sorrow. And I was quite inspired when I, when I saw that well. It's quite a, an amazing thing to think they'd build this great big memorial just because uh, Queen Victoria drank out the well. But the well's still there, and the well's still uh, giving uh, weary travellers uh, some refreshment. And as I was thinking about the well, it reminded me of uh, an event in the Bible when the Saviour sat by a well. And we're going to take time just to read it together. As a woman came out to the well and she met the Saviour there at the well, and her life was changed forever. And this afternoon, as we think about these things, I want really just to, at the start, say that your life could be changed forever this afternoon, in the same way as this lady's was when she came to meet the Saviour by the side of the well in Samaria. So let's read it together, just the narrative from the Bible in John chapter 4, and we'll read, begin to read at verse number 5. So he, that's the Lord Jesus, came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me to drink. Uh, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, the Samar a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans? Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he'd have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The little phrase I really want to think about, but when we read the answer, the answer the Lord gives to the lady, we can understand some of it, and some of it might seem a bit strange. Well, we can understand the first wee bit when it says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. We all know that when we don't go to a well nowadays, but when we go to the tap to get a drink, we know that we'll be, we'll be back, won't we? Maybe even just the same day, maybe just in a few hours, we'll be back because the water we get at the tap, we need it for a short time, and it feels good and it refreshes us, but we need to go back for more, and that's just, we, we can understand that. So when the Lord says, whoever drinks of this water out this well, you'll be thirsty again, we can understand that. But he speaks about some other things there, and he says, but the water I shall give him will become a fountain of water, spring up into everlasting life, and never thirst again. And that's very strange and very odd. And so we need to think about what that actually means, because actually, it's, it's, it can trans this, if you understand this, this could transform your life. So when he says, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, we understand that. Water we need, and it makes us we're thirsty, we go and get a drink, it refreshes us, and we need to go back for a, a drink again. But what does the Lord really mean by this? He's meaning about, and when he says, whoever drinks of this water, he's talking about the physical water. But he's actually really just reminding us all, and reminding this lady, and reminding us all as we listen this afternoon. No, we all are missing something. We're missing something in our lives, and we have that thirst for something that we can't actually satisfy. To understand what this really means and what the Lord is speaking about, we need to go back to the beginning, right away back to the beginning, the beginning, beginning of time, way back into the beginning of the, the Bible, to the book of Genesis, and in Genesis chapter 3. Because when we look into the beginning of Genesis, we find that when God created the, uh, the worlds and he made this beautiful garden and put the first man, Adam and Eve, in the garden, they had this wonderful relationship with God. And we can see here 
And they had the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So God would come down each day uh, in the cool of it, just as it, the, the heat went away. He would come down probably kind of late afternoon and he would walk and he would talk with Adam and Eve, just as you and I do if we meet our friends and we go for a walk and we have a nice time, we chat together and it's, it's a good thing. We, we enjoy each other's company and we've, we've come to realise the benefit of that happening after a time of not being able to meet with people. It's so valuable just to have time with people and to enjoy the company of of friends. And it's hard to believe, but this is how it was. Way back in the beginning, God would come down and he would walk with Adam and Eve and he would be friends with them in the, in the same kind of way that we'd be friends with each other. And that's a wonderful thing, that close relationship that God had with Adam and Eve. What's remarkable is this. That's the whole purpose why God created Adam and Eve, to have that friendship, to have that fellowship. And that's what he wants with the human race. But you can see here in a little verse here that Adam and Eve and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Why did they hide? Why did they hide them? Well, I suppose really if you think back to maybe when you were younger and you'd done something that you hadn't and uh, your parents found out about it, you would try and keep it away from you, well, wouldn't you? Because you just knew it was going to be awkward. It may be painful uh, back in the days when uh, you were about to get a smack, but uh, when you were younger, but maybe it's just awkward. You know, you, don't, you know you're going to be in trouble. You know, you know you're going to get around and it's something you want to avoid. I suppose we can take it even forward to when we're older as well. And if, if one of our friends does something to hurt us, that relationship's spoiled, isn't it? You, you maybe don't want to speak to them. Uh, and, and, and maybe if you've done something, you maybe feel a bit awkward and you don't really want to meet that person because you know it's going to be awkward and difficult. Here it was with, with Adam and with Eve. They had done something that God said not to do. God had given them one prohibition, said, don't do this, and they did it. And so they knew in themselves that they'd offended God. Now, we offend each other from time to time and with, with greater or lesser, to a greater or lesser degree. But here when we're speaking about God, we need to understand this. God's standard is absolute perfection. God is a God of absolute holiness. And so when we offend God, things maybe wouldn't be a big deal for others, just the things that we do wrong. It deeply offends God. And the Bible tells us that we've all done that. So for Adam and Eve, what happened there, right at the start, the thing that they were hiding from and the thing that made things awkward for them was a broken relationship, broken relationship with God. They'd done something that offended God and the relationship was broken. So how does that affect us? Well, as we come down, down the centuries and down the thousands of years to where we are now, we come to a point where the Bible tells us about us. It says, there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Now, that's a wee bit hard for us sometimes to take. But here's the fact. The Bible's very clear about it. As far as we are concerned with God's standards, we've all come short of God's standards, every single one of us. And I guess, really, if we're honest, we'll all perhaps maybe just agree with that as well and realise that we've all, at some point in life, to a greater or lesser degree, we've all done and said things we shouldn't have, and maybe not done and said things that we should have. And so we've all, we've all done things that are wrong. We've all had sin, what the Bible calls sin, just falling short of that standard of absolute perfection. None of us are perfect. Isaiah says, oh, we like sheep of God. We just like to do our own thing. Don't we? we don't like to be told what to do. That's just human nature. And down through the centuries, that's how it is. So for you and I, it's not so much a broken relationship because as we grew up, as we're born and grew up, we just grew up with that sinful nature in us and we just do wrong, don't we? We do things wrong, it's just kind of in our nature. And so for us, it's not so much a broken relationship, it's a missing relationship. Right from when we're young, we don't have that relationship in a natural state, we don't have that relationship with God. Now, what's all this got to do with water and being thirsty? Well, here's the thing. Because we have that missing relationship with God, because God made us to have that relationship, there's something missing in our lives. Now, we perhaps maybe don't realise it and don't appreciate it, but deep down, we all know, don't we, there's quite often just something missing in our lives. And people find that and they're searching and looking for something and maybe perhaps don't even realise what it is. It's this relationship with God, and it affects us deeply. There's something there, not there, that should be there in each of our lives. We are made to have a relationship with God, and we're missing that relationship. So, what do we do? Well, because we maybe perhaps don't know what we're looking for, we try to fill that gap, fill that void in our life with lots of different things. 
So down through the centuries, people have tied all sorts of things. They've tied so religion. Again, I'm speaking about this earlier. I don't know how many religions there are in the world, but down through the centuries, people have worshipped the, the sun, the stars, the moon. They've worshipped trees. They've worshipped animals. They've worshipped carved images. Uh, and, and all sorts of religions now with all different philosophies and things like that and people have tried all these things because they know there's something missing and they're trying to find it and it kind of is a bit like a drink of water it maybe satisfies for a wee while but still, still there's something missing and you have to go back people have tried all sorts of things people have tried, well maybe if I, maybe I get plenty of wealth and possessions and I feel good, I've got things around about me that'll make me feel happy, that'll satisfy me and I think we've all found uh, over the last, certainly over the last few years, the pandemic has shown to everybody that wealth actually is very transient. It can disappear very, very quickly. And it doesn't really bring that satisfaction that maybe people actually found. And again, it's like chasing a shadow. Your perception of wealth is maybe, you know, there's always somebody more wealthy than you. And, so, you know, so it's, it's all very relative. So wealth doesn't really bring that deep satisfaction that people actually are looking for. People have thought, maybe it's power. Kings and rulers and religious leaders and all that, all trying to get power. Power is the way to do it. And uh, that's good, but people have found that that only, and again, it you know, maybe satisfies for a short time, but you need more. You need more of it because it doesn't actually satisfy. Also, kind of lifestyles. People try all kind of lifestyles, all different things that they try to fill up their life just to find that thing that's missing. Maybe it's following sport, maybe it's whatever, whatever it is, all sorts of things in different kind of lifestyles that people try just to fill that missing void because there's something missing. They don't know what it is, they're looking for it, but they can't fill it, they can't fill that void, they can't uh, satisfy that need. And I suppose, sadly, some people have tried different substances, maybe, maybe something will do, maybe whether it's alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, some substance can do, maybe that, and again, these things will maybe happen for about a short time, it'll make you feel good, but actually, the, as we all know, the effects are catastrophic in many occasions. So, where have we got to? But look at all this, and we have to take the words of a, there's a great man called um, Solomon, and he wrote all these proverbs in the Bible, but he also wrote the book of the Ecclesiastes, or, or the, it just means the words of the preacher, the teacher. And he had tried all these things. He tried wealth, he tried, he tried everything, all sorts of lifestyles. And what does he say at the end of it? He says, absolute futility. Absolute futility. Everything is futile. It's all a waste of time, he says. It doesn't, doesn't bring that satisfaction. It doesn't meet the need of what, of what we're actually missing in our lives. What does he say? He says, the eye is not satisfied with seeing and um, the ear is not filled with seeing. All these things that we try, that we can try, whatever the things we've been thinking about, you can try them, but you just need more and more and more and more. They're never actually really, truly satisfied. They're transient, they're satisfied for a short time, but you need more. They're not really <laughs> filling and meeting the need of that missing void, that thing that's missing in our life. And of course, that thing that we're missing is a relationship with God. So what does, Ecclesi what does uh, Solomon say? I have seen all the things that are done under the sun and I've found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. Well, so far that's maybe been a bit depressing, isn't it? Not very positive, a bit negative. But let's see, we're thankful that the Bible has the answer. And that's what we've come here this afternoon to bring, to bring the answer to this problem. I suppose we need to understand the problem so we can get the answer. And the answer is to be found in one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ said these words, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I wonder, is there something missing in your life? Whether you're young, whether you're older, do you feel that something, there's just something missing in your life? Here's what you're missing. You're missing the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. How can he do that? How can he, how can he repair that missing relationship that we have with God? How can he restore that relationship? How can he create that relationship between us and the holy God of heaven. First Timothy chapter 2 tells us this. It says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one person who is able to restore that relationship between us and between God and bring us into full, uh, give us that fulfillment and that real meaning in our lives here on earth. Who's able to do that? Well, the Lord Jesus went, as we know, we're thinking about it Easter time just recently, we're thinking about it. And what does it say about the Lord Jesus Christ? It says, he gave himself a ransom for all. Gave himself a ransom for all. What does that mean? Well, we've been thinking about Easter time, about the empty tomb, but before that, on Good Friday, we think about the cross, don't we? We think about the cross at Calvary. And we think about those three crosses there 
But in the central process, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Bible tells us that when the Lord Jesus Christ was there, he took upon himself the punishment for your sin and for my sin. So all the things that we've done wrong, the things that offend God, the things that actually make sure, mean, act as a barrier between us and God, that stop us having a relationship with God, the Lord Jesus Christ came and he says, all those wrong things, give them to me. For the whole of the world, thought from all the way down the centuries, right down to now, here, for the folks here in the cow and beef this evening, I said, I want to take all your sins and I'll take them. I'll take them. I'll take the punishment for them there on the cross at Calvary. If you can't understand that, I'm with you. It's hard for me. I can't get my head around how that's possible, but that's what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us the Lord Jesus took it took it upon himself our sin. He had no sin of his own, but he took upon himself the sin of you and of me and of the entire world. He took the punishment for it there at the cross. Because you might say to yourself, well, actually, I'm really not that bothered because my life's, my life's been okay. And my life still is okay. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Okay, there's maybe some things not right, but on the whole, I'm pretty happy. So I don't really have a need for this. Let me just point you to uh, to the future. Because this is really absolutely vital and really important. Because it's not just now. It's not just now. Come back to this verse in a minute or two. Notice chapter 6 says this, For the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, pretty bleak words really, but I want really to take us to, to, to the future. We're going to look in the book of Revelation because this is actually vital for, vital for us to understand. That our sin will have an effect on us on our life, but actually more than that in the future when we die. Because in Revelation chapter 20, the writer John has given a vision into the future and events that are still, about to, that are still to take place. And here's what he writes. He says this, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not for nothing in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If you think maybe you don't need the Savior now for your life because your life's not too bad, I want you to really seriously think about this. A lot of people put their head in the sand and think, well, this is not going to happen to me. The Bible is very, very clear. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know what the biggest tragedy about this is? There's absolutely no one in this hall tonight needs to be there. There's no one alive in, this, in the town of Cowdenbeath needs to be in that lake of fire. There's no one in the country of Scotland needs to be in the lake of fire. There's no one alive in the world today needs to be there. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ came and took the punishment for us on the cross. Why? So that we don't end up there. And this is the message of the Bible. It's a very, in some ways, it's very stark and almost really uh, something really we need to think about. Very sober to think that you could end up there. Why? Because you refuse to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe even just neglect to do it. Anyone not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. So we come back again to the verse that I had up just a second ago. So a verse written in Ephesians, written to Christians, and it says this, to these people who are Christians, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross at Calvary, he took the punishment for your sin and for my sin. And so we can be brought into a relationship with God now. We can have that relationship repaired. We can have that missing relationship. We can have that satisfaction in our hearts. And as Christians, we understand that and we know that. We've experienced it. But more than that, when it comes to the future events, we will find that our names are written in that book of life. Our names are written in the book of life. Your name can be written in the book of life this afternoon. Right now, where you are. If you're willing to accept the Lord Jesus Christ died for you on the cross at Calvary. You know, it's actually true. We can actually have the best in both worlds. You can have the best now, here on earth, but you can have the best when it comes to eternity. So really, just want to just bring the challenge to us this afternoon. Are we right with God? How do we get right with God then? Let's be clear about this. Let's be absolutely certain. What do we need to do to be right with God? What do we need to do to have that relationship restored, to have that relation, that missing relationship uh, fixed and how to have that satisfaction and that thing that we're missing in our life? 
Now, what do we need to do to make sure that we don't end up in that terrible place with Lake of Fire? Well, the Bible is very clear and very simple. I'm going to read it from Romans chapter 3 and from the New Loving Translation. I think it makes it very, very clear to us. Romans chapter 3 says this, We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And again, I said earlier that I can't really get my head around and understand how God could, uh, you know, how the Lord Jesus Christ could take the punishment for all of our sin. But we're not only asked to understand, here's what it says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. But he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Here's the wonderful thing. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter your circumstances, you can be made right in the sight of God. God can look at you just as if you'd never sinned. And all we have to do is just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a very simple thing, but it's profound. It's profound. It's life-changing. And it's actually more than life-changing. It'll change your destiny for eternity. Can I recommend to you this afternoon, whether your life's great or whether you have that emptiness, take the Lord Jesus Christ. You can fill that emptiness in your life, but more than that, you can make sure that you will never want to take the punishment for your sins yourself. And back, back again to the word of the Lord Jesus. Whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him will never thirst. That satisfaction in life, that meaning in life is perhaps missing. The Lord Jesus is able to fill that. But the water that I shall give him will become a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Life beyond this life. Life into eternity and escape from that terrible place to make of fire. Why? Because the Lord Jesus was willing to take our place and take the punishment for our sins.